Good afternoon and welcome to MAE 209, Probability and Statistics. My name is Richard Kohar and this is Lecture 7. Hopefully everyone can hear me clearly in the chat. Make sure you give a some sort of indication, thumbs up. And I believe what we're going to do, I believe this is um, in the textbook. So in our textbook that we're using is uh, section 2.4 still. Okay. Good to see. And uh, probably just a couple announcements. So we have a quiz on Thursday. And uh, the details will be provided through Moodle. More than likely, it's going to be very similar. There will be an assignment um, type or submission. So it'll, you'll submit through Moodle. Uh, it will be unproctored. You will be able to, I'll have a Zoom call available for people to join so that if there are any questions during the quiz, people can ask immediately. And uh, what will be the format of the quiz? The quiz will be two to three questions. You'll have to write it out on paper, the solutions. You can either print out the questions if you have a printer. If you don't, you'll just write it out on uh, paper that you have available. And uh, you'll probably, uh, so it'll be uh, solutions on paper. And then you'll uh, scan either using uh, what you have, like a dedicated scanner You can use a phone app, such as um, Cam Scanner has been fairly reliable, I've seen students use, or you could use a tablet. The quiz will cover up to section 2.3, which was put on the, uh, it'll cover up what we've been covering in class. But you can see the details, the, the sections are um, up to section 2.3 in the textbook. Mm -hmm, exactly. If we have an app that we can use to write online and convert to a PDF, would that be acceptable? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could use that or you could, uh, you could do solutions on paper or um, you could use a tablet, but as, but uh, basically, you are submitting a PDF, and make sure that it's viewable. So make sure that you are submitting a PDF. Um, you know we're not going. No, like JPEGs, no um, TIFFs, you know, 20 megabyte TIFFs, you know, no s single like uh, pages, no zip files. So you're submitting a single PDF. But we're going to put more details about that on the Moodle webpage, okay? So hopefully that gives you an. A picture it's going to be very similar to how things had run in your previous course like uh, in 101 
Is that all good? Just gonna check. Maybe I'll just put that in the chat. Oops. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so again, the guiding principle, you're just submitting a single PDF. You'll, uh, it's unproctored. I'll have a Zoom call open if you want to ask questions. You'll have a time limit. We don't know yet, maybe between 15 and 20 minutes. You'll have about like five to 10 minutes to scan and submit it. But as long as you're submitting a single PDF. Okay, so uh, we had done this last time. We talked about the multiplication rule that uh, we can write this as uh, this is from our previous lecture, so you don't have to rewrite this again. But the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of B times the probability of A given B. And you can rearrange this in different ways. We had done this with, uh, for instance, we did this with the example where we had the probability that you draw two queens from a well-shuffled deck of cards without replacement. And, uh, you know, what's the probability? that you get two queens. So if I, uh, nope. so again, you would have a, a deck of cards here, well shuffled. And without replacement, you would pick two cards. What's the probability that you drew two queens on the first two cards? Well, when you take one card, so let's say if I had how many queens there are. Going through the deck here. Oh, two queens. Oh, I had them all stuck there. There's the other queen. So there's 52 cards in here if they were well shuffled. And let's just say that yeah four queens in a fair deck yes and there will be a lecture after the quiz so again you draw one queen the probability of that is 4 over 52 which then means that you have three queens remaining in the deck and how many cards are in there in total left over? Well, there's 51. So we multiply those together and we got 12 over 2,652 or a very small probability there. Now we have the example. Let's say, uh, consider a computer network. Assume that a hacker could be in the network with probability 0.03. Let's see if I put my cards away. And everyone keeps saying there's the four. Okay, so, you know, well shuffled in a deck of 52 cards. Okay, so we consider a computer network. We have assume that the hacker could be in the network with probability 0.3. If the hacker is in the network, the admin software alerts the network staff with probability 0.95. If the soft uh, the software will generate a false alert with probability 0.1. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to define my events. I think this is important. So. We'll let uh, E be the hacker, well, be the event, but be the hacker is in the network. And we'll let F be an alert. That's from the software. And what I'll do is I'll draw 
a tree diagram. So I'm going to have this as uh, my first event here is going to be E and then E prime or E complement. So that's where the hacker is in the network and this is where the hacker isn't in the network. So over here I'll put f, f prime, f, f prime. So I have my, I'm going to use a finer pen. I'll use green. So here is where I would have the probability of E. And then over here would be the probability of E prime. Here is the probability of, so along this branch, we would have the probability of F given E has occurred. Over here would be the probability that F prime, so that there's no alert given that there is an intruder. And over here, here's the probability that there is an alert given that there's no intruder. And over here, is the probability that there's no alert given that there's no intruder. When we multiply these together, when we multiply these together, we get the intersection. So E intersect F here is equal to the probability of E times the probability of f given e. Here would be e and f prime. And so again, you would multiply those out. So on and so forth. So when we have something like this, when we have something like a test or an alert, and there's uh, trying to detect the presence of someone or something, you know, someone like a, an intruder or a disease, and we have a test, when we have that there's an intruder or a disease, and then we have the test is coming, is generating an alert, we call this a true positive. Here, where we have an intruder and there is no alert, basically the system is saying it's okay, there's nothing wrong, this is what we'll call a false negative. If we have no intruder but we are getting an alert, well this is called a false positive. And over here, we have a uh, no intruder, and we get no alert. Well, this is a true. This is a true negative. Okay. So now that I've labeled this tree diagram. What I need to do is use the information that we have from the question. So we're told that the hacker could be in the network with probability 0 0.03, which means then over here, so this is the probability that there's a hacker in the system to begin with, it's 0 0.03, which means that the complement should be 1 minus 0 0.03. So that means that the probability of no hacker in the system is 0.97. Okay, maybe I'll switch up my pens to keep it color-coded. Let's use orange. 
So over here, if the hacker is in the network, so we're in this case right here, if the hacker is in the network, the administration software alerts the network staff with probability 0 0.0 Oh, sorry, 0.95. So that means that if there is a hacker in the system, we'll get an alert with 0.95. And that means that it will not generate an alarm if there's a hacker in the system with 0 0.05 probability. Doesn't a false alarm would imply that there is no hacker? Well, this would uh, this is kind of slightly redundant. So you could say that there is no hacker and just an alert, but that alert is false because there is no hacker. So you could think of that as being redundant. Or extra info. Hopefully, does that answer Lucas your question? What I should do then, since this is quite small that I'm doing. I'll zoom this in slightly. Oops, there we go. So you can see what I'm doing here. Okay. And the software will generate a false alert with probability 0.1. So this is the information that we have here. So I'll put that down here. It will generate a false alert so that there's no hacker in the system, but it's going to generate an alert. That's 0.1. And that means that it will, if there's no hacker, but it, it won't generate an alert. That's 0.9. So, what's the probability of no hacker and a false alert? So just in the comments or in the chat, what event is this describing? So is that E and F, E and F prime? Which event are we looking at? Yeah, we're looking for no no hacker. So this is E prime and an alert. So that's F. So that should be, so the and is the intersection. So we'll have E prime intersect F. So looking over here, what we want is E prime and F. So that's the probability of E prime times the probability of f given e prime, so that's 0.97 times the probability of f given e, so that's 0.1, so that's 0 0.097. Yes, that's correct. This would be a false a false negative. Now, let's have a look at no alert even though there ha is there is a hacker present in the system. So no alert 
So that's no alert, f prime, and there's a hacker present, so e. So that's also just by communitivity. It's asking for e and f prime. So we're looking for the probability of e and f prime. So that's this branch right here. Oh, somebody said, uh, somebody, oh, my, my apologies. So it should be E, it should be a false positive. Thank you. There we go, <laughs> we've corrected it. And uh, the next thing is we got E and F. So probability of E times the probability of F prime given E so 0 0.03 times 0 0.05. So we have 15. Oh, yeah. So did I do this correctly? Just making sure everyone's following along. So E and F prime, so that would be a false negative. All good. So that is the end of that example. Any questions about this? Okay, so this is what Bayes' theorem is. For two events, Say, we'll say two events, E and F. So I'll draw out my kind of tree diagram again here. We'll use E as our first event. Next one that we'll have here is F. So what Bayes' theorem is looking at is we can think of this as 
in this simple case where we have two events, let's think of this as we have a cause, and then we'll have an effect. This is E, and then we have something like F. So for instance, you could have a cause, which is a disease, something like COVID. But we don't know necessarily if the person has it or not. We see things like effects. We see things like um, symptoms, like coughing, fever, headaches, fatigue. We can also have things like tests. The test could come back and try to detect the presence of the disease. But again, not all effects are due to a disease. For instance, if I had a headache, it's not necessarily true that I have COVID. So you can see that the disease causes the effects, but not all of the effects are due to the disease. So that's what Bayes' theorem is about, is that we're trying to figure out, given that we have an effect, what's the probability that it's being caused by this? So again, what we can do is we can fill out our probability tree here. This is the probability of E. Here's the probability of this would be the probability, so you have E here, so that's the probability of F given E. Here's the probability that the effect, you don't have that effect, but you still have the cause. Here's where you have the effect, but you don't have the cause. And here's the probability you don't have the effect and you don't have the cause. So again, I can write out each of these events here. So here's the probability of E and F, E and F prime, E prime and F. And same thing, you can write out each of these branches. By multiplying them together. But notice that this is the probability of both of these occurring at the same time. So you don't have the disease or you don't have the cause and you have the effect. Okay, it's not just given that you have the effect, what's the probability that you have the cause? So we'll get to that in a second. So I just kind of finish writing this out. Okay. So the big question that we're interested in, given you have the effect, whether you have symptoms or you've done a test, um, let's say a defective part, Given that you have the effect, what's the probability? You have the cause. And so essentially what it's Bayes' theorem is about is answering this question of give, uh, the probability of the cause given that you have the effect. Now we can answer this because we know from conditional probability it's the probability of E and F, so it's both of them together, 
over the probability of f. But uh, you might be asking me, where are we going to calculate the probability of f? I, we can see we can how we can calculate the intersection of e and f. But how do we calculate f? Well, what I'm going to do then is show I'm going to label these as branch 1, 2, 3, and 4. We have that, uh, this is the first branch here, so E and F. So I'll say that this is the probability over here. So we want branch 1 over the total probability of F. Now F occurs here and here. So we have those cases. We have the two cases where we have E and F and E prime and F. So again, we can still have that, the cause that we have that we want, but it, it doesn't, sorry, we have the effects here and here, but we have to also consider that that effect could be present without the cause. So, it ends up being that we take branch one over branch 1 over branch 3. So you can think of it as this is the outcome that we want where we have E and F happening but we have to also divide it by the total number of ways that are possible still and given that we have F we have to look at branch 1 and branch 3. So I can write this out then See if I can zoom out a bit so that I can keep all of the. I need this up here. So I have branch one. So it's the probability of E times the probability of F given E, all divided by, again, itself. Plus this third outcome, or this third branch. Oops. Okay, so that's how we can do it for two. In the textbook, they do give a little bit of a more generalized event uh, with Bayes' theorem. So you let A1, A2, all the way up to AK be a collection of K mutually exclusive and exhaustive events with prior probabilities. So all they're saying is that what's exhaustive, that they take the examples, the entire sample space, S, and that uh, if I had, they just kind of break it up into the entire sample space. So you could have A1, A2, A3, A4. Okay. Then for any other event B, the posterior probability of AJ, given that B has occurred, is this formula. So again, they have the probability given B. So again, it's just this event and B all over the probability of B. Now we can think of that as, so they've broken up A. So let's say we have A1, A2, dot 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 and we go up to a 
we'll do AJ. And that will be up to AK. What they're saying is, is then we'll have B and uh, B prime or something else like that. B and B prime. can have something like that. There's our tree. And so what they're saying is, is if we want this J1, it will be, this is the one that we want. So that's the branch we want. So that's the probability of A, J, and B. And to get the bottom one here, B, you need to calculate all the branches here where B occurs. So it needs to also be looking at all these branches here. And so that's what it does here, is it's just summing up all those branches. So here would be the ones that we need to also calculate. So that is where we would have over here, all over all these possible branches. So you have A1 and B, which we know is equal to the probability of A1 times the probability of B given A1, probability of A2 and B, equaling the probability of A2 times the probability of B given A2 all the way down. So you would need to sum these up. So while that formula may look scary, all we're doing is we're just looking for the one branch that we want divided by all the possible branches where we have that effect showing up. So the probability of f equals just a question in the chat. Okay. So Bayes' theorem is quite a, a powerful. It was actually named after this guy here, Reverend Thomas Bayes. We don't really know when he was born. He died in the 18th century, and uh, his work was actually not published until three years afterwards, in 1763. Maybe two years. And... Uh, Again, it's a very powerful technique that uh, we still use to this day. So here's the example of very common example that we use, especially now because we are living with a pandemic at the moment. Here's an example of a rare disease. <clears throat> Let's say that there's only one in a thousand adults is afflicted with a rare disease for which a diagnostic test has been developed. The test is such that an, when an individual actually has the disease, a positive result will occur 99% of the time, whereas an individual without the disease will show up uh, a positive test only 2% of the time. So that's what we would call a false positive, right? If a randomly selected individual is tested and the result is positive, what is the probability that the individual has the disease? So again, this is a very important question. We'll let Oops. 
we'll let E denote the event. That the individual has the disease. Similarly, we'll let uh, F denote a positive test. So what, what's required was the probability that the individual has the disease. So the probability that the individual has the disease, given that the individual tested positive. So again, so it's the probability of E given F. So we start out drawing our tree diagram here. And we start filling in the data. So we have only one in a hundred or one in a thousand adults is afflicted with this rare disease. So that's the information right there. So it's 0 0.01 and from that we know that it's point oops point zero one which means that it's point nine 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 for the complement. What's the next part? <clears throat> the test is that when it actually has the disease, so given that the person actually has the disease, a positive result will occur 99% of the time. So we'll put, so the test is positive such that Okay, so that's important. That's 0.99, which means that the complement should be 0 0.01. And lastly, oh, an individual without the disease will show a positive test only 2% of the time. So 0 0.02 and 0.98. So that's all the information we need. So we're looking for the probability of F, I'm sorry, the probability of E given F. So that works out that we want, just writing down here, what I would like is branch one, so it's branch one over branch one plus, I'd like this third branch. So that's what I'm doing over here. So it's 0 0.001 times 0.99 all over the same thing. Plus. Now I need to do branch 3 here. And plugging it into the calculator. So it's 0 0.001 on top there. Mm. No, point zero zero one times point nine nine. So when we multiply it. Times point zero two. And 
that. And so I get point zero four seven two. So we get roughly it's about a four point eight percent chance that the individual has the disease given that the test is positive. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, that sounds counterintuitive. Wasn't the diagnostic test supposed to be accurate? We were told it's, you know, given that they have the disease, it's 99% of the time it's going to be accurate, right? Well, the problem is, is that just because it's due to the rarity of the disease, it's very rare, one in a thousand adults have it, that most tested most positive test results would arise from errors rather than from the diseased individuals. So as the disease becomes more rare and rare, the more accurate the test has to be in order to guarantee or to make sure that the test results are reliable. And what I would say then is as an exercise, for those of you that are looking for just a quick exercise after that you've done this, and we have two minutes left, what's the probability that the person doesn't have the disease given that there is a positive test? If you're looking for specific branches, it should. It'll be uh, three over one plus three. Okay. If you have any further questions, feel free to send me an email through my RMC account. Remember that we have quiz on Thursday. Check Moodle for more details. Tomorrow we'll post. And if there's no more further questions, thank you everyone for tuning in and have a great rest of the day. Take care. Yes. That's correct, Eric. How would you recommend studying for the quiz? Yes, doing the homework and going through and reviewing through the examples that we did in the lecture. Take care, everyone.